Welcome to the Not Old Better Show. I'm your host, Paul Vogelzang. As part of our Smithsonian Associates Art of Living series, our guest today on the Not Old Better Show is author and historian William Seal. William Seal has authored many, many volumes on the subject of historic renovation, including the book The President's House, The White House as History on an American Idea. William Seal is also editor of the award-winning journal White House History of the White House Historical Association. Well, I think I think it's ironic, really, and, and interesting that when the White House was being planned by George Washington, a house five times the size and 20 feet taller than the present White House was envisioned, and it was called the palace by some people, kind of generally. Well, that was whittled down to a house, just a house, small by comparison, and yet today it's the most important house in the world. It's achieved in a sense being the palace, but it's still the house George Washington built. That, of course, is our guest today, William Seal, part of a four-session evening course on the most famous address in Washington, Perspectives on White House History. You can find out more about the series at our website, but please join me in welcoming to the Not Old Better Show via Skype, William Seal. William Seal, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Well, I have a question. First off, let's start kind of at the start with you. How did you become interested in historic homes, including the White House? Well, I was interested in restoring historic houses, and I was a a historian, and uh, uh, I wrote a book about state capitals with Henry Russell Hitchcock and was fascinated by that. And there are 130-some capitals that were built in this country, but of course the We have the ones for each state today, and that's what the book was really about. And then I got to wondering about houses, houses of state, and kind of stumbled into the White House (laughs) 40 years ago. And um, I have stuck with it pretty much to find it interesting. The more you dig into it, the more interesting it gets, and the more we find out that we didn't know about it. So that's how I got involved. Well, good. Well, sometimes stumbling is good. Is a good. (laughs) Was it something that you were always interested in from a career standpoint? This idea of historic preservation. Yes, always interested in that, and and in writing about it, and writing about buildings and people who lived in buildings, uh, how they lived in them, and that sort of thing. It was was sort of a new field. Uh, the, many years ago, and now there are a lot of people in it, and a lot of very good books about that. Um, and so I've just stuck with it, and I've asked myself at, at junctures, I should leave this. This is <laughs> too long to spend on one thing. And then I would think, well, more it's more and more and more. And the White House Historical Association, which sponsors most of my books, is uh, and the journal that we added here called White House History has been uh, very generous with it, uh, with this work and encouraging. So here I stick <laughs> <laughs> with the subject <laughs> after these years. Well, you really have written some fascinating, important books. We'll put links up to all the books and in, in the Historic Association as well. But Great. going back forty years. Tell us, what what's the most surprising thing uh, that you've learned in your career about some of this renovation? Well, the fact that the house has all, the, at least the sacred parts of the house, people some people have looked on it symbolically at, at times when it could have been torn down, and it wasn't, and it's been threatened a number of times. Of course, the British took care of it in 1814 and burned it to the walls, but President Madison for, for political reasons as well as practical reasons, wanted every stone preserved. He wanted, it's, it was pieced together like a puzzle in some places. So the original walls are original to what George Washington and his Scotsman built. And then it had other junctures that, that, was, in tr- that was in trouble. Uh, President Arthur tried to tear it down and replace it, and the public went wild and the Congress went wild. There was some... Uh, very capricious additions were proposed in in uh, 1889 by President Harrison and again by McKinley, who wasn't too excited about it, in 1898 and 9. And um, uh, still, they, they didn't go. People didn't want it changed. And so Theodore Roosevelt had it altered to uh, reflect modern uses, but insisted that the building be restored. It's an early date for restoring things. And so the building stayed, but it was rethought 
to function better within the same walls. That's when your wings were added. Uh, there had been wings there, and the east wing was gone. They added it as an entra a new entrance. You used to go in the front door, and there's a new entrance for security and all. And then the west wing was had an addition built for offices. So for the first time in a century, the offices were moved out of the White House proper. And then again, it, it came up in our modern technical age to President Truman that there were serious um, defects in the structure. Uh, that, that Roosevelt's re renovations in 1902 had been done in a hurry, and some of the uh, partitions that had been removed were simply suspended from tie rods into old wooden structure. And then in 1927, a, a third floor was added, kind of tucked away under the attic, and they cut those tie rods off, so there was no support for some of the ceilings. So the first idea was just to gut it on the second level, because the other two levels were okay. And then finally they decided to really gut the whole thing, and Truman insisted that those walls be kept. And the third floor was kept, and the outside walls of the 1927 third floor. And uh, one time Truman, he inspected the work every day when he was there. He loved building. And they were chopping, or beginning to chop away at a door so they could get a dump truck in there to dig the cellars and a bulldozer. And he said, no, you're not indeed. You don't touch that door. So they had to take the dump truck and the um, earth mover bulldozer, take them down to the ground and rebuild them inside mm -hmm. to do their work. My so the, he, it was a sacred regard. And then Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, uh, during his administration, approved the cleaning of the stone. It had been painted so many times that it uh, would not hold paint anymore. It was being painted once a year. So a 20-year project took place. It was a great inconvenience to the presidents. Some of their rooms had plywood over the windows and all. Not one complaint. Hmm. And it was finished in the Clinton administration, and so the paint was all removed from the stone. The stone was repaired and conserved, and a light coat of paint was put on it, and and it did the trick. And, of course, it changed for the world the uh, uh, technology involved in cleaning and preserving stone. It was a model to everyone. So it's been it's been a sort of sacred place in the in that sense because of George Washington's connection and all all the presidents who lived there except Washington and it wasn't finished for him. I really I love that term a, a sacred location. Sixteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue is an address. Uh -huh. Really, we all know, but this we we know this as a as a home to these first families and as a museum. So how, how do you blend this kind of restoration that you're talking about around some of these first families that live there? What, what do you do? It's a home and a museum, both. Well, they have, it's accumulated uh, as a museum. Things that were there and the stories that are told are part of, part of it. Dolly Madison and the painting and Lincoln and, and all those stories accumulate. You know, you can't help but have a museum quality to it. Mm -hmm. President Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to add, uh, did add the East Wing as a museum, but it was during the war uh, when he extended the East Wing, and it was immediately became offices and was left unfinished, and then it never received its museum, and the artifacts that he had collected are now at uh, Hyde Park, but the fam it's zoned in a way. The second floor and the third floor are family quarters, bedrooms, and bathrooms and such, and then the state floor, the main floor you enter, has the formal parlors and, and dining room and all. There are no restrooms on that floor. That floor is served by the basement or ground floor, which has the restrooms, coat rooms, movie theater, and so forth. And uh, that state floor is the front office of the White House. That's what the world is supposed to see. And it's... Uh, furnished and treated as to reflect certain periods of American history as as it happened in the White House. And many, many things have been in the White House before, uh, not necessarily all at the same time, but uh, these various things have been pulled together starting early, starting really with uh, Mrs. Hoover in the 1920s and then climaxed by the Kennedy administration 
when uh, it was institutionalized, uh, the furnishing of the house with the curator and all of that. But only that only started in the early 60s. It never had a curator or anything else. It had storage. But um, now today everything is computerized and the family can look at a, a catalog and see table. The president needs a bedside table. They'll show him or, or his the first lady a uh, book that shows bedside tables that are in storage, and they can pick one and it's there in, within an hour. So it, it's all uh, very formalized, and the museum, given the museum quality, uh, you have that in that sense the combination of private life in the house and the museum. And of course, people are not used to living with 30 servants anymore, <laughs> and uh, there is a small kitchen on the family floor, the second floor, and um, uh, various facilities that reflect our modern way of life. But the White House itself, on another level, is run very formally, as it has been for a century, uh, because when people come there to visit, it's very special, and the, the president wants it to be very special. So dinner is very formal and elegant, and people will never forget being there. So there are all these functions of the house, and it takes a lot of people to keep it going. Well, William Seal, um, thank you so much for your time. You just have been so generous. These stories are wonderful. We'll put links up to everything. But I, I guess I just have one final question. We're talking to you today from the White House Historical Association. What are the kinds of things that the White House Historical Association does? Well, the White House Historical gathers funds. It's not its main role. Its main role is interpreting the White House to the American people. It has books, uh, a journal, an ongoing journal. It makes donations to the White House to restore the antiques and historical things. And occasionally when something really special comes along that's actually documented as having been there, the association will raise the funds to pay for it. So they're a very active historical association with uh, websites and educational programs and uh, sort of the whole thing of a, of a modern historical society, a whole gamut of, of activities. Well, thank you very much. William Seal, author of the book, A White House of Stone, Building America's First Ideal in Architecture, talking to us today from the White House Historical Association about the presidential house. Thank you, William Seal, for Thank you, Paul. I appreciate Thank it. You. Bye. Bye-bye. My thanks to our guest today, William Seal, part of a four-session evening course on the most famous address in Washington, Perspectives on White House History. You can find out more about the series at our website. My thanks as well to the Smithsonian team for all they do to support our interviews. As usual, we'll post links to everything, and also as usual, my thanks to you, the listeners for joining me today. Your time is valuable, and I'm grateful you're spending some of it with me. I'm always interested in feedback, and you can leave that at iTunes, Google Play, or send me email at info at notold-better.com. Stay tuned for our next show, another great one, as we talk about better. The Not Old Better Show. Thanks, everybody.